20 years ago, the Rwandan genocide began. In a hundred days, almost a million people were killed. Today, Rwanda is thriving. Its president credited with stopping the slaughter and putting the country back together. He's also accused of brutally suppressing dissent. So is Paul Kagame a savior or a dictator? Journalist Soria Samora has been finding out. For centuries, the tribes of this country lived together without tribal atrocities, and nothing like the Rwandan genocide ever took place. Then, in the 1920s, Rwandans were measured. This is how the Belgian colonists decided who was a Hutu and who was a Tutsi, so that they could use tribal identity to divide and rule Rwanda. And this European measurement and division of the tribes led directly to the Rwandan genocide of 20 years ago. When the Belgians put the minority Tutsis in power almost a hundred years ago, it led to decades of growing hostility between the two tribes. The tribal divide deepened with the Hutu takeover and Rwanda's independence in 1962. There were atrocities, but nothing compared to what happened in 1994. Between April and July of that year, a killing frenzy, unlike anything the world had seen, seized this tiny landlocked nation. Led by an extremist government, Rwandan Hutus murdered almost one million of their Tutsi neighbors, together with their own moderates. It was the most rapid slaughter of humankind in history. The majority of victims hacked to death by machetes. This genocide memorial site, just north of the capital city Kigali, is one of many that now serve as a reminder of the horror that befell this nation 20 years ago. I've seen this level of hatred and brutality in my own country, but to think that almost a million people died like this in just 100 days, God. For three months, while Rwandans were being slaughtered at a rate of almost 10,000 per day, the rest of the world did nothing. The killing only came to an end when a Tutsi-led rebel force, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, commanded by a 36-year-old Tutsi refugee called Paul Kagame, defeated the extremist government and took control of the country. The first thing they did was to detribalize the nation. In the last 20 years, under the leadership of Paul Kagame, Rwanda has been reborn as one of Africa's most unlikely success stories. The country is one of the safest on the continent. The economy is booming. 98% of the population have universal health care, free education. The average life expectancy has doubled. President Kagame has been hailed as a visionary leader. And yet, he has also become one of the most controversial. Many believe that there is a dark side to this story. No press freedom, no real opposition. Many of his opponents have fled the country, others in prison or found dead. The truth is, like a lot of Africans, I can't help but respect this guy for what he has achieved. But I want to know more. I want to get to know the man himself and to find out what Rwandans feel about their country today. I am going to have two interviews with President Kagame. In the first, I'm going to ask him about his achievements. In the second, I will challenge him to answer the most serious allegations made against his leadership. Mr. President, thank you so much for your time. Um, we know that the genocide is about 20 years ago now. You, you inherited you know, a terrible situation. What was it really like? And how exactly did you know where to begin in the first place? We had uh, a population totally displaced. We had the people killed. We had the millions of others crossing our border, going into the neighboring countries. 
we had no functioning institution. Everything was completely dismantled. So we, we, it was just devastation. It was just chaos. For me, bringing back the people of Rwanda to see themselves uh, as uh, uh, one nation and uh, being able to work together for their own development is really the starting point. We need to turn things around and say, no, let's say, unity will always lead to progress and success. It's a basic thing. This is something that, uh, so this is really something we have hammered out every time. And, and I think it is uh, taking root because people, we are learning from our own experience, our own history that has been so devastating. And we are alongside that, we are demonstrating how being together, working together, thinking together, and also being different can actually be used for progress, for development. But will this unification of the Rwandan people last? I think the amount of work we have done to change things, change the mentality, to change the thinking of people. And the very lesson is uh, brought by the suffering and, and, and all the horrific things that happened to us in the genocide. I don't think uh, there would be any grounds for the country going back to, to those uh, bad days. Th that is my belief. Like too many Africans of this generation, I share the experience of war. In my own country, Sierra Leone, we suffered our own terrible conflict in the 90s, which I filmed. But unlike here in Rwanda, Sierra Leone hasn't moved forward. There has been no proper reconciliation process, no significant development. Corruption is still rife. There are so many African countries that continue to struggle like this, Yet here in Rwanda, something very different has happened. Paul Kagame has led Rwandans away from the tribalism that fueled the genocide. His government passed strict laws banning tribalism in public life. These laws have landed many opposition leaders and journalists in jail, but they have also done much to wash away the hatred between the tribes. But has tribalism really gone away? I went to meet a group of youths who had formed a grassroots organization called the Hope and Peace Foundation. All of the people here are either children of genocide victims, children of killers, or children of women raped during the genocide. Blaze, a Tutsi, and Vincent, a Hutu, were next door neighbors. Vincent's father murdered Blaze's parents. Yet today, they are best friends, and Vincent has even gone on to marry Blaze's sister. Blaze. These young people are all innocent victims of Rwanda's terrible history. But they have all embraced President Kagame's vision of a united country where tribe no longer has any meaning. It is an ongoing process, but what I've seen here is the foundation of Rwanda in 2014. The next day, I went to meet Blaze and Vincent at their home, this time together with Vincent's wife Joyce and their new addition to the family. Vincent and Joyce had been a couple even before the genocide. <laughs> Thank 
akaba yarahawe imbabazi ko nyine tukaba twarabayumwe ko nyine na kibazo nyine kigihari how did you manage it how did you did you learn to to forgive and get married to Vincent, the young man whose father was responsible for your parents' death. How did you, how did you do it? You never tell no kuno yash exabim babasi mubse you way. When you never tell no kuno na way amun daga kaunda yin arina with jaja when yin and yin is him yum fam. This incredible story of reconciliation is what it means to be a Rwandan today. The pain these people and so many other Rwandans have suffered is perhaps what has motivated them to pull together and rebuild their country with such astonishing speed and success. This place really and truly makes me feel proud to be an African. If this, I wish this was what the rest of my continent looks like. Because look at how green it is. Look at the city. You know, everything is just being taken care of. They are paying attention to details. You know, number of cleaners all around bunched together and they're just constantly working. You see them all over the place. You know, I look at all these guys with their motorbikes, all of them with helmets on. Passengers have their helmets. You know. It's the discipline, you know, that even on the road, it's it's so not Africa. With the rise of Rwanda since the genocide, thousands of Rwandans who were living abroad have returned. Media entrepreneur Albert Rudachimburwa returned home from Belgium in 1994. So, Albert, can you tell me what's what's going on here? What's happening here? as part of Rwanda's dream coming true. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, this is a, a, a new TV channel. We only had one public state TV that was only working from, from a little room somewhere. You know, it was just news and stuff like that. And, and I said, no, but TV is much more than that, you know. Development is not just about, uh, about the serious stuff. It is also about having a normal society entertaining each other and, and being in touch. Mm. This all sounds ex exciting and usually these, you know, as an African, these are sort of investment that you will see coming from outside. What, what, what prompted you to, to, to look into this direction? Like, we, we, we went so low that we, we, we don't want to be distracted by anything that could make us look in that direction again. So the nice thing is that we were lucky to have at least a leadership that, that sets the stage. And now we are in a momentum where Rwanda is, is, an, is really an opportunity for anyone at all level. Rwanda's remarkable development has won President Kagame respect around Africa, the world, and at home. In the two presidential elections in 03 and 2010, he won with 95 and 93 percent of the vote. Remarkable figures. But not everyone believes that the country is so united. Many international NGOs and human rights groups point to the intimidation of critical voices in the country. Under a broad range of laws, dissenting figures have been silenced. Opposition politicians, journalists, former government officials. The government argues that these people simply broke the law. Human rights groups say that many are the victims of an authoritarian regime which doesn't tolerate criticism. Over the years, President Kagame has earned a reputation for cracking down on political opponents, free press, and even members of his own political party. Some have fled the country, others have been imprisoned. There are those who even claim that some people have been killed by the government. Stanley Gatera is the editor of one of the few newspapers in Rwanda that openly criticizes the government. In 2012, he was jailed for a year after his newspaper published a commentary suggesting that men might regret marrying Tutsi women only for their beauty. The court ruled Gatera broke the strict anti-tribalism laws. 
Stanley, a Tutsi, believes there were other factors behind his arrest. To me, it's because my newspaper is criticizing the government. As I said before, many journalists which works for private newspapers, they fear this country. For me, I do not fear the country. I stayed and that's why they put me in prison. Stanley's brother, Nelson, was also a journalist and founder of the paper that Stanley now runs. He was also threatened with imprisonment and fled the country three years ago. It looks like you two were really close together. Yeah. You must be missing him. Yeah, yeah, so much. They also tried to, to harass me that I also free the country, but I said no. I said I, I, love, I love this country. It's my country. So I want to stay with them and do Every, every person do what he's supposed to do to develop this country. Whatever the circumstances of his imprisonment, Stanley's experience and that of many other Rwandan journalists reveals a darker side to President Kagame's government. As an African journalist, I've spent time in prison myself, and I share Stanley's desire to see press freedom develop along with the rest of his country. Perhaps his fight is paying off. Last year, the government signed off a series of media reforms that indicate a willingness to loosen its grip. But it's not only media. President Kagame is equally accused of political repression. Two opposition leaders are currently behind bars, both charged with divisionism. The only opposition party with its leadership intact is the Democratic Green Party. I met its leader, Frank Habineza. Things to do with democracy, that has been his biggest uh, challenge. It was more of authoritarian tendencies than democratic tendency. So uh, we took it upon our, ourselves as a duty to help to bring democracy to this country by starting an opposition party. It has taken Frank's party four years just to get registered. The first stride in the run-up to the 2010 presidential election, one that was marred by allegations of political repression. Frank's party was stopped from registering while other opposition politicians found themselves in prison. Frank's vice president, Andres Ruizereka, was found murdered. His head almost entirely severed from his body. It was a very horrific death, very, very horrific. Some of our people even went to prison, like our deputy secretary general was in prison for two years, and others went into exile. Some have not yet come back, and uh, I'd say that uh, those who are dead, who are still investigating, and do you see any signs that uh, that this tr struggle is a struggle that you are winning or you're going to win? Yes, yes. We think that uh, uh, there's some changes, of course. It was not like this. Uh, uh, even five years ago, uh, to, w there was no any opposition party at all <laughs> five years ago. <laughs> you understand? So for them for, to even allow us to be registered, it is a small change that is taking place. It's not only at home where President Kagame has caused controversy. In the last 20 years, the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, has been in a constant state of turmoil, largely due to the mass arrival of Rwandan Hutu refugees in 1994. Many of them genocide perpetrators who fled as Paul Kagame's forces advanced. The refugee camps on the border became bases for the exiled extremists who waged a bitter insurgency against President Kagame's new government. Two Rwandan invasions in the 90s emptied the camps and most of the refugees returned home. But President Kagame is accused of continuing to meddle in the affairs of his giant neighbor. United Nations monitors reported last year that Rwanda has provided arms and reinforcements to the M23, a Congolese insurgency that uses child soldiers. Rwandan troops have previously been accused of committing atrocities during its invasions of the Congo and of looting the DRC's natural resources to boost the Rwandan economy. 
Some believe President Kagame is an uncompromising and destabilizing figure in the region. As we were preparing for our final interview with the president, another controversy raised its head. An attempt had been made against the life of the dissident former Rwandan army general, Kayumba Nyamwasa. He is one of the president's most prominent critics, and it is the third time that such an attack had been made. Only in January this year, another of President Kagame's former senior officers, turned exiled dissident Patrick Karageya, was murdered in a hotel room in Johannesburg. Other opponents have perished in similar circumstances. The next day, we had our final meeting with the president. I decided to ask him directly if he was involved in the attempted murder of his former army chief and the successful murder of his former chief of intelligence in January. Really, I don't understand the basis of uh, the focus, uh, mainly on these people and trying to whitewash them as if they are innocent and all kinds of complaints against us, about them, <laughs> I, I don't understand the basis. Uh, what is for sure is that uh, there are such a people that have been carrying out uh, terrorist uh, activities against our country and uh, our people have suffered on the hands of these people. So wh what we are accused of, we have been waiting for anybody to provide even the slightest evidence to point to that, to prove what they are saying. When Patti Karageya, your former spy chief, was found dead in South Africa, um, many suspected that you were responsible. And when your Minister of Defense was asked about him, he said, when you choose to live like a dog, you will die like a dog. What does that mean? The meaning is, somebody who was uh, serving the country he chose to call his own and later on turns against it, starts getting involved with organizations that are carrying out terror in this country, on whose hands many have been killed, others maimed, very kind of feel it's like uh, this person deserved it, uh, deserved death, whatever the cause was. This, this is where it comes from. Mr. President, every tyrant, every dictator, every authoritarian regime justifies anti-democratic policies, imprisonment of opposition leader, repression of the press as necessary for the national security and the good of the country. What makes you different? I am here not as an imposition, first of all. I'm here because the people of Rwanda have chosen me, have elected me, and, and actually accept me as their leader and respect me as their leader. So, calling, you know, everybody a dictator, authoritarian, tyrant, or I, I, I really don't understand it. Rwanda is a country still haunted by what neighbors did to neighbors, while the world's leaders looked the other way. For 20 years, this nation has been stitching itself back together. It's been a painful and difficult procedure. Huge sacrifices have been made. In order to make this country and my continent a better place, maybe this is the price that we have to pay. Some important questions still remain unanswered by the government here. But President Kagame's intolerant rule over these last 20 years has taken Rwanda far from those million lives so brutally ended in just 100 days. And the future? Perhaps the true judgment of Paul Kagame's rule will be in how this country progresses after he's gone.